right. So, Mr. Castle, how the hell does it work? Wow. We it was birthed uh, in the canal of reality shows and ultimate fighting and uh, our friends who play video games like 24-7. Um, we came up with some stupid idea like, uh, let's make a movie about a live human video game. And if, if given the opportunity, would we as humans want to control another human? If given the chance, would you? And, and our answer is yes. That's why we made this movie. I'll buy that. Word. I knew about um, uh, the sim world and uh, Second Life, and I found that very interesting. And when I read Game, I thought, well, this is a combination of, of Second Life and what's going on in the, in the video game world, uh, combined with a terrific action movie. And um, it, was, it was great. But you know, this, is, this game is really about um, Mark Neveldine and Brian Taylor and their imagination. And having done the first Crank movie with them, I know them pretty well. And they also produced a movie for us called Pathology, which we liked very much. And these guys are really good guys. They are uh, very, very imaginative. I think the studio's excited. We were tapping into something that was very relevant, which was, was gaming. Um, they were very excited about us throwing our style on something a little bit bigger, a little more grounded, something with a, with a, a love story. Something that uh, was a little more straightforward, good versus evil. My reaction was it was, um... Uh, like everything they do, it's 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 far out, but it's grounded in reality. It's um, it it isn't it isn't fantasy. In fact, everything in the game, although it's in the future, is really taking place right now to just a lesser a lesser degree. And I knew it gave them the opportunity to to possibly make a unique film. There's no question that society is outrageous. You know, it's 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 wild. It's kinky. And I think at times they wanted us to pull a lot of the, uh, the creepy, weird, wild stuff that we do out of it. And we, we battled and we kept as much as you know, we could in. And that, and the, at the end of the day, is the, big, is the big difference between making a cheap movie and an expensive movie. Is, is the kind of like, how far can you push it? How far can you go? You want it to be more accessible for a bigger audience. And they're spending a lot of money. They're investing a lot of their money. They're taking a risk. They're going out there and... Um, you know, just to play devil's advocate, because they are the devil. So just to play devil's advocate, uh, they have a good reason to do that. You know, they want to protect their investment. They want to make sure as many people see the movie as possible. And some of the crazy, uh, some of the crazy shit that we put in movies, it's like, uh, it's not for everybody. It was a little confusing to read, and parts of it actually on the page can be really confusing. Really so confusing. they had to explain it to us, especially Brian Taylor is more into the video game world. So he's able to explain some of the intricacies of that. Um, but, uh, it was complicated on the first read. One of the, um, the things you have to learn being a producer is uh, to trust uh, young talent at, to, to, and, and to um, uh, support their expression. You know, as long as it's done responsibly, that, that's really where sometimes you get the absolute best movies. I mean, I, I sort of defy the, 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 the executives at, at Warner Brothers to, to actually have read Matrix and knew exactly what the story was, but um, giving the Wachowskis a chance, they made a great movie. So I, I, I don't think game is as complicated as, as Matrix, but it does have some complication to it. But ultimately, if you really like the guys that you, you're working with and you trust and you can cast the movie up and make it re reasonably, you got to take that shot. I mean, let's face it, like, crank movies are like audience torture. We were talking about this the other day, like, these movies, not only are we torturing our characters, when I mean, we look at the things we do to Jason in the crank movies, but we're torturing our audience. It's like, it's like beating them over the head with a hammer for 90 minutes. And, um, you need to use a little bit of a softer hammer, maybe like a ball peen hammer, as the budget starts to get bigger. You know, maybe Instead if we do Instead of a geological hammer like we've been using on like yeah. Amy Smart and Amber Valletta. Yeah, or it like kind of hurts, it's a little painful. Sledgehammers, you know, and maybe yeah. someday when we're doing a $200 million movie, we'll have to use one of those like foam wiffle bats like they have at baseball games. Maybe we'll have to use that kind of bat, but we think we still swung a pretty, pretty fucking hard hammer for Gamer, mm -hmm. considering that it was a $50 million movie. Mm -hmm. It's not as though it's a hundred million dollar movie. Again, it's their perspective because right. those crank movies are so cheap to make. Um, but it wasn't, you know, it wasn't this huge budget movie. So they had to be very smart about how they went about right. it. Maybe it looks like more than we spent, but right. I mean, by comparison, for the, with the level of action, the level of 
of experience that we were delivering, um, the movie is is very inexpensive comparatively to other, you know, movies that are out there in the marketplace that are delivering the same kind of experience. Yeah. The approach of it is exactly the same though as anything else that we do. You know, um, it's just it's just more scale instead of a fight scene with six people. It's a it's a battle scene with two hundred people, but we're shooting it the same way. You know, we're building a big sandbox, getting everybody in there, and we just show up and start playing and finding. Uh, finding the cool the cool point of view on it all but they're they're very smart they're very talented and they're completely dead straight honest uh, there's no manipulation uh, which makes everything that we do possible uh, because they're that way you can trust them all the way and if they say they can do something they always do it camera issues you know they fuck you up on some what can you do we're, we're trying to create you know, 50 different locations that are all different and all you know sort of futuristic and urban and every different look imaginable um, all in Albuquerque, Albuquerque, New Mexico. If you walked around Albuquerque and then you saw the movie that we did, you wouldn't recognize any of it. So we were really using every guerrilla filmmaker trick that we had acquired up to that point to get the level of production out of that movie that you see. And it was a low budget movie. You know, in ways it was, when you compare the story and what we were trying to do to the mm -hmm. money we had, it was, more low budget than Crank. It was. Because what we were trying to do. They really have an innate and natural ability to create these kind of concepts without over creating them, overthinking them, creating great characters and yet keeping this element of freshness and, and youth and progressive thinking and yet their kind of sickness and their pervertedness is, you know, it has a lot of stuff in there and, and it all, you know, what's best about their work is it feels effortless. You kind of feel that they just sat down, wrote this script in a couple of hours, and it just made perfect sense, you know? They just, they're, they're very talented. It's always good when you sort of have the uh, freedom uh, to cast the roles, uh, you know, with the best people, and they have some sort of process. We've known Jerry for a while. Uh, I worked with him back in 2001 on a tiny little film. I had worked on a short film many years ago that Mark had been the focus puller on for a guy who's become one of my best friends and he was just passing out of um, his uh, film school. We stayed in touch and he was actually uh, one of the guys who read Crank, loved it, wanted to do it. They sent me Crank and I read Crank and I went, this is awesome. I actually really wanted to do Crank. Jason was already involved at the time. Uh, we were already kind of down the road with him. We said, hey, if, if Jason falls out, then maybe there's a possibility you could slide in and be the guy. So we always had him in the back of our head as somebody, you know, who could be in our movies. But we stayed in touch and they said, look, we have a couple of ideas and they sent this one to me and it has all the hallmarks of, a, you know, Neville Dean and Taylor's sick yet genius mind. And after we wrote Gamer, he was kind of the, the, the only action option out there uh, for us to go to. And of course, he's coming off the success of 300 and it was, you know, we were blessed to have the guy. Isn't it amazing? Like, like Jerry Butler was really like that close to being Chef Chelios. It could happen. So, um, and we always, you know, we always liked him. It's it's really hard to find. It was hard on Crank to find that iconic action guy who's also a great actor and has soul and he can sell things with his eyes and he's a human being. Baby, stop! Stop! God damn it, you in the air control. Let her talk. I can't. She has to say what I tell her. Amber Valletta is one of the most beautiful women I ever met. And, um, and yet she's taken this role that is really hard. I mean, it's a dark, depressing kind of this woman who's, who's ashamed and full of guilt and there's nothing going on. And it's, you know, a lot of hopelessness in there and grief. And there's not a lot of light in that role. And, and she's taken it on and she's done it. She's done it brilliantly. Amber came in and auditioned. Yeah, she just kicked way. ass. She came in and read. Uh, I actually had never heard of Amber Valletta. I mean, I didn't, I didn't see Hitch. I didn't see some of the things that she was in, and uh, so it was a totally fresh face to me. And she again had that really great quality of just being like sort of, like I mean, she's perfect. She's got to be like one of the most beautiful women in the world. But at the same time, she has this real soulful quality in her eyes and this vulnerability that's exactly what we needed for that character. I'd never seen a woman um, in a role like this. And it felt modern. It felt, um, 
like a journey that I, I knew I had to go through, and I fought really hard for this part. So, Miss Roth, here it says that you are applying for the custody of your child. Delia. Her name is Delia. She wants so much to do well, and she's so motivated, and. She's really, I mean, I think she really has a chip on her shoulder in terms of wanting, she wants to be taken seriously as an actor. And she wants people to know that she can really do this. And so she works so hard. I mean, she worked harder than, than pretty much anybody on the show. And we were so impressed. She, I mean, she was so professional. And like I say, such a good person, such a nice person, that you just root for her. Um, and you can see the results on screen. I mean, it's, it's a great performance. It really is. We were proud of her. You know, we had that elevator scene, and you know, she's such a sweetheart, and I just was feeling this movie. I had, I go, I went home feeling bad a couple times, <laughs> you know, a couple times. You know, I mean, the stuff with Gerard, I felt great about. But what I, what I did to poor Amber, and, and just you know, playing th that mind game because she's such a you know a sweetheart, um, and she played that scene so deep, man. I remember tears coming down her face and the whole thing, and I was like. This chick is acting her ass off. You know what I mean? And I was like, you know, it was one of those moments where, you know, I, it, it affected me long after that. That's another guy who, uh, you know, you'd never know by looking at him what a nice guy he is. And he was just like such a pleasure to work with. The guy's so enthusiastic, so professional. Um, so here's the Terry Crews story. So his first day on set was the scene in the locker room, which, um, it was one of those odd days when we showed up in the morning and, and, and looked at the set and the costume and the idea of these two guys with their shirts off, kind of greased up in a locker room in a prison and sweaty, just taunting each other. And, and we just thought, you know, is this, is this going to play as the gayest scene since Spartacus? Is, not that there's anything wrong with that. It's just it wasn't exactly what we intended. And we were a little worried about it. But we, we were looking to expand our audience, so we weren't afraid of it. Expand, I mean, you know. So. Uh, so it was a little bit of a shock to us when, with these kind of considerations, when, when, when Terry showed up and said, guys, you know, I, I have an idea. I got an idea. I've been thinking about it all night in the hotel. Great, Terry, great, great. Anything, anything you want to bring up, you know, we're, we're, we're wide open to it. Um, and he said, I'm thinking, what if I do the whole scene, the whole scene, buck naked, just buck ass naked. I didn't even want Jerry to know but I basically stripped down naked, covered in blood, and that was the first time he saw me. <laughs> and he was like, what? And, and I wanted that actual, like, what the hell is this? You know what I mean? This is not, this is not Terry Crews, it's not whatever. And I remember I just took my clothes off and they covered me in blood and we did that scene and he was like, this, this is dude nuts, whatever. But I, I, wanted to, I wanted him to know that I was gonna go all out from day one. And we're just like, really? Yeah, yeah. What could be scarier than this fucking naked black guy covered in blood in prison? Uh, <laughs> you know, when you put it that way, I can't even argue with that. Go for it. I love it. Let's do it naked, right? And so that was actually him. You just think this dude is out of his mind. You could see that in a, if you had that picture in an insane asylum, you'd just be like, this, I, I couldn't put together a worse vision. You know, and I just felt like, you know, that's something I would fear. You know, and I just knew that that was the only way to do it. There's a lot of ass slapping going on that day, weirdly enough, you know, like at a football game. Yeah. Um, you know, you, it was you just could a play strangely, just... strangely uncomfortable day, but it was supposed to be, you know, it's supposed to be a scene that kind of like is disturbing and gets and he's a little, he's too close and he's too weird and it's supposed to kind of like make your skin crawl. And, uh, you know, we, we achieved that thanks mm. to the incredible Terry Crews. The new face of Slayers, pure, crystallized horror, two stories high and bathed in bloody red. He is what they want. So, you know, we have this uh, character that we were writing, um, Ken Castle. And uh, at the same time we were writing the movie, this little show was on TV called Dexter, and we're huge fans of Dexter and Michael C. Hall, and, and uh, we also saw him in Six Feet Under. I don't know if you did, I saw him in Six Feet Under. And uh, I had only seen Dexter. Thought the kid was an amazing actor, amazing range, and we started writing it with kind of Michael C. Hall in mind in a way. 
Absolutely. And I mean, that guy was like, he was an actor who was so exciting from Dexter. Yeah. Like I said, I'd never seen Six Feet Under, so to me, Michael C. Hall and Dexter were like the same guy. But I remember the day when Michael came in to meet with us, um, and you know, by the way, Lakeshore had never heard of him either. And Lionsgate, he was kind of, this was, Dexter was, um, it still had, had yet to sort of like break on the public consciousness and be this big show. And, uh, but we were just sold on this guy as, as, as an actor um, so hard. We were just like, we've got to get him. And, uh, and the studio said, look, we don't know who he is. He's got to come in and meet with us. So he said, fine, we'll bring him in. We had a meeting uh, with Michael C. Hall. I met him with, with Brian and it was fantastic. And I remember when he walked into the studio and I met him in the lobby, he looks and acts exactly like Dexter. It was so creepy. I was just like, God, was Dexter just walked in, you know, and uh, he's like a killer. He works for the cops and he's kind of edgy that way. There's something not quite right about him. It seemed like getting on a funhouse ride, you know? I mean, I get to be um, unashamedly lascivious and do a Sammy Davis Jr. soft shoe and beat up the action hero of the year while I'm controlling him with my mind and uh, have a really strange and very severe hairstyle all in the same movie, so. I hate bad guy roles. Well, not so much I hate them, but they're the trickiest ones. They're the hardest, they're the easiest to pull off in a very average way and the hardest to pull off in a brilliant way. Um, and, and with Castle, you know, I mean, he, he is such a powerful guy, and there, but there's so much going on in that mind of us, but it didn't want to feel very obvious, like, oh, look at me, I'm the, the bad guy in the Bond film, you know? And, and, so, and I hadn't seen his stuff. Now I've seen a lot of it, but when I worked with him, he blew me away. I mean, I don't know how he does it. You know, I just come down here for a few days here, a few days there, and he is just uh, showing up every day. I don't know that there's a scene in this movie he's not in. And um, I mean, perhaps there are times where they cut away to uh, the guy who's controlling him, Simon, but he's still pretty much a part of those scenes as well. And uh, he's got a he's got a great energy about him. And uh, Hopefully your seat, I'm not in. a tremendous amount of energy. And sometimes I feel like he's made such an impression on me. It's like I hear him like in my. Uh... <laughs> and you can tell just talking to him, he's so cerebral. He takes such a such a focused, laser precision, intellectual approach to figuring out everything about the role and coming up with his take. And uh, it was and so we were happy about that because at least with. someone uh, was intellectual on the on the God, shoot. And that helped out a lot. Amazing. <laughs> I've been a fan of them, of course, ever since Crank, and I think that was a great movie. It seems like they're, they, they take very small budgets and make a world out of them, and I think that's what every studio is looking for. He came to us after uh, he saw Crank. It was probably in 2000 and late 2006, I believe, or early 2007, and um, he asked for a meeting with us, and it's like, we were like, absolutely, we'd love to take a meeting with Ludacris. Uh, and he came down to Lakeshore and we sat with him and we were just impressed just to be around Ludacris and he told us how much he loved the movie and wanted us to write something for him. He said, God, you guys, you know, you got to write something for me. So we, we kind of did. As directors, they're extremely different from every director that I've ever worked with. So when I say that, I just mean in the sense of, you know, they, they, their camera angles, the way that they're not afraid to get out there and, and you know, do things themselves. You know, they, they've done some pretty dangerous stunts behind the camera themselves, so the world that they've created in this movie is even crazier than, than, than the crank. We had a lot of fun with him. Ludacris is a cool guy to hang out with, and he, uh, I know there's a lot of artists, musical artists out there who take themselves very seriously, and Ludacris doesn't. He's just uh, just really great at what he does, and, and uh, he's a, just such a cool face to have in the movie, uh, to be that sort of underground guy, um, and him and Logan Lerman played well together. You like the software? Software? The walkie-talkie player. No shit. You're the guy from the TV, the humans. That's right, baby. You think about what the brother said? To what brother do you refer, brother? To find the kid to play Simon was, was, was difficult. We saw him in 310 to Yuma, and uh, when he came in to read, he just, he had all those great qualities about a kid, just the curiosity and, um, and, and this, sort of mature intelligence too at the same time that Logan has. 
you know, really insightful kid. Working with dots, you know, little orange dots everywhere is a little complicated, but you know, you get used to it, you get the flow of things, and you know, you kind of adapt to the different style. One of the great things about shooting digitally is they're not big, noisy cameras, and you don't ever have to worry about rolling out, really. You just pop a compact flash card out and pop another one in. So the actors don't really ever know the camera's rolling, so we just rolled all the time, and a lot of what we used in the movie were sort of little natural moments that weren't even scripted, and he didn't even know the camera was rolling. When you see him warming up for the game, he's actually warming up to do his performance. And we loved it. It was so natural and so young. And like, uh, he had a lot of little moments like that um, that just kind of make, make it real. You know, I, th I thought it would be disconcerting having two directors, um, but it's not. It's been okay. It's, you know, usually one of them only comes up to you at a time and it's, um, it feels good, it feels okay. And what feels really great is having them operate the camera. I just love that. I really love having that, you know, the person that is gonna have the final word actually looking through the camera and getting what they want. I like that. Some of the names we were talking about for that part were all over the map, you know, and she was always one of them. Cause, uh, I mean, she's great. Um, and she was one of the first people to read it. And when she responded, we kind of just started honing everything on, in on that, you know, and all, those, all the other crazy names started falling by the wayside and we started thinking like, uh, you know, can we, can we make this, you know, can we maybe even like fine tune this character and make it better for Kira? I guess they're kind of loose and that helps me to be loose, which I think is, you know, kind of the best, the best way that sets can be if they're open and free and you can kind of just try stuff and see what comes up. We actually thought, you know, she's like this big time actor, actor, you know, and, uh, and we thought she was going to be sort of this very grounding influence. And when she showed up, her performance was actually more over the top and cartoonish than, than a lot of the other ones. And we loved it. We did, never expected that from Kira. But she's almost like, she's like a Dick Tracy character. It's awesome. Trace was supposed to be played by a young Latino with cornrows, this hard-bitten uh, girl riding a motorcycle. And, uh, yeah, Gary, that was another one of those roles yeah. where, like, literally, like, there were so many different odd, odd names coming in for it. There was one point where uh, we were dead set on getting MIA to play that role, and she was like interested, and it was all like a big deal. We were all excited. Like Man, can you imagine MIA, yeah. but then she was on tour and she couldn't do it, and then she was having a baby. It just it became too complicated. So how you go from MIA to Allison Loman? I have no idea. I didn't know who uh, who Allison was. Brian. Uh, knew Allison from, I believe, I just knew her Matchstick from Matchstick Men. Men. The only thing I'd ever seen was Matchstick Men. And uh, we heard, you know, she's great. She, she wanted to come in to, to meet on the movie, and I, you know, they, the Brian and, and both Gary explained to me who, who she was, you know, said she's this uh, hot blonde girl, amazing actress, blah, 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 and I just was kept saying, yeah, okay, hot blonde girl, but we need a, a badass Latino girl with cornrows right. to ride a motorcycle. And by so the I, way, I couldn't wrap my head around it. And by the it. way, she looks like she's 13. To and, factor that um, into. I just went in and uh, talked about the character and asked a couple questions, and I felt really confident with uh, the directors and, and the movie, the writing and all that, so I wanted to do it. At the same time, uh, she tells me she didn't want to do an action film. She wanted nothing to do with it, and her agent kind of pushed her into doing the movie, and Gary coaxed her into doing the movie. Yes, you, <laughs> you got me. <laughs> um, I didn't want to do it because uh, I wasn't really into action movies. I just kind of, whenever there's an action movie that people hand me, I just kind of put it in the, no, I don't want to do that pile. And um, my agent and Gary were saying, you know, why don't you try something different and kind of move out of the drama genre and, and you know, uh, take a risk. And, and uh, if there was any action movie to do, I thought this would be, the most interesting. Hi. <laughs> it's a masterpiece. <laughs> it is kind of a masterpiece. <laughs> and, you know, of course, as soon as she shows up on set and you see her perform and, and see how stunning she is, it's just like, bam, you're, uh, you're in. Yeah, you ended up getting her. Yeah, you ended up, you ended up getting it, right? Yeah, and I, I get, ended up understanding it. Well, yeah, like he didn't get it at first. Very quickly. He didn't get it, he didn't get it at first at all, but I think he, en he ended up getting it. I ended up figuring it out. Yeah. Day one in Albuquerque, you just bang, yeah. He was like, I get it. I understand. 
You know, you read the script to Taxi Driver and you won't see Travis Bickle the way you know him. Um, if you're using great actors and we strive to get the best actors we can, then, then part of the expectation, part of the expectation of them doing their job is, is they have to bring something to it. You know, they have to bring something. And everybody who worked on our movie brought something to it that surprised us um, and made it, made every day kind of like a discovery of your own words through a different interpretation. It was, it's great. I mean, that's where the tightrope walk is and that's what's so fun about it. Um, if people just show up and sort of give you exactly what you pictured note for note on the page, then it's kind of boring. When you make a movie, not only are you casting actors, but you are casting the technicians that are going to help um, make the movie in the, in the smoothest way. It would be like, you know, if you're a general, it's, it's you know, it, not only do you, you, you know, you have to have the right colonels and the right majors and the right sergeants to, to win the war. And um, with Neville Dean Taylor, they've done two movies for us, okay? So uh, we met certain technicians on the first movie, and then, um, uh, for instance, on the, on the movie that they produced, they produced a movie called Pathology with this uh, director, Mark Schulerman. Mark Schulerman introduced us to uh, uh, Eckhart Pollock, who was a German cinematographer. Eckhart's an amazing DP to work with because he, he's very serious and meticulous about what he does. And Brian and I, we, we love composition, we love lighting, and we're very much into it that way as DPs as well. However, we're running gun. We've got a lot on our minds. We're out there directing it and, and you know, doing all these crazy things with these cameras. So it's great to have this very grounded, centered, uh, serious individual who's helping light the scenes and, and you know, grabbing another camera, helping compose these rock solid shots to sort of cover our ass when we're doing these crazy uh, action scenes. And, uh. <laughs> we had different operators as well, not only Mark and Brian, and I was operating as well. Uh, stuff like, you know, with the shallow focus, the kind of really tight and close-up stuff. I do this so often, so it's, for me it's, it's easy to do that. And for them it's easy to grab camera and just go like hell. My aggravation, if you will, at times with these guys is that they endanger themselves. That, that, that bothers me because I don't need that headache of one of them getting hurt and then feeling slightly responsible. I mean, the producers, if, you know, producers are kind of father figures. You have to be responsible for your, for your team, for your guys, for your girls, for your, for your crew. That's, that's what it's about. So, yeah, anytime Neville Dean puts on those skates, you want to make sure that it's smooth and that he's, 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 he's all right. But he, he's more courageous than, you know, than, than the average, average guy. In the beginning, I was a little nervous thinking about how this is going good and they, they were really open-minded and said, you know, let's watch it, let's discuss it, let's, uh, let's think what we can do better or, or we follow this track. And there was no discussion, not at all, in the, in the whole entire movie because we, we all agreed how it looks and how it should look. Eckhart is so good and he's got so much of an ego that he, he actually is a perfect temperament to work with us because um, you know, we've got very strong opinions about the cinematography all the time and about every shot and about the, and plus we're operating all the time. And uh, um, if, if you don't have a really strong sense of what you're doing and if you don't, if you're not super confident and not insecure, then you're just going to get, you're just going to get blown over um, by these, by these knuckleheads. And uh, he was completely able to handle it. And it was, he was the perfect guy to work with, you know. We would sit there and shoot stuff, and uh, sometimes he would operate a few shots himself, and 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 we, you know, we we'd pick him to do certain types of shots that we knew he'd do really well. And we'd say, you know, Eckhart, can you operate this one? He said, Oh, you want to look good on this shot, okay. You know, it was just like, he he just had this way of like kind of like insulting and mocking everything we did in a funny way. <laughs> Whenever the jib arm came out, we usually put Eckhart on that because it's what he uses for all of his German commercials yeah. and German oh, TV shows. Oh, you want it to look like a movie for this shot, okay? I do it. Half blue. No dogs. Half blue. Dogs, dogs are. No, I mean they're going to come out. That, that's five blue. In the beginning, we were talking about we were talking about the style on general, and there were two kind of moods, two kind of uh, things we tried to figure out. One of the things about the look is there's actually several looks, and 
it, the movie jumps back and forth between these different worlds. There's the world of society, there's the world of slayers, and then there's the real world. And um, we jump around so much that it was really important that each world have a very distinctive look and color palette so that you knew where you were. You didn't want to be in society and think you were in slayers or vice versa. So. Mark and Brian first came up with the idea and said, you know, what, what do you think about shooting digital? What do you think about shooting red? And at that time, red was a kind of rumor all over Hollywood, all over the world, and everybody was saying, you know, this is the, that's the future. And I wasn't sure if it's, if it's right or wrong, but I was quite open-minded and said, let's do, uh, let's do a couple of tests. That looks really good. Look at that blue sky. This was no polarizer. No, 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 no. <laughs> nothing. Nothing. It's like transparency. It's yeah. pretty hot. It looks polarized. Burn up. Holy shit. <laughs> well, that pops off the screen. God damn. Is that pink? Oh, well, the colors are going to be a little off. Does that the cameras have the ability to be incredibly poppy and colorful and saturated and uh, what we wanted to use is use the power of that resolution and the power of the shutter because we like to shoot a high shutter speed. But we didn't want it to be as colorful as Crank. You know, we wanted to shoot this really dark world and of course we're in Albuquerque with these sort of pastel uh, southwest colors that we had to knock out of the film and... Um, There's only two colors in Albuquerque. Yeah. Tan and teal. That's it. That's it. If it ain't got tan, then they're not a fan. <laughs> if it don't have teal in it, they're not feeling it. I'm telling you, it's not like they only, it. they only, and maybe actually there's some salmon, sal salmon too. Like there's like, I mean, you're looking at this place, you're like, you want it to be a futuristic kind of urban environment. And you're looking around and you're seeing a salmon covered freeway with like adobe buildings behind it. It was a grim scenario for us in the early days before we started to dial it in. What can we do with color? What can we, how can we add color? How can we treat color? How can we, how can we handle the color uh, not to get too kind of, you know, cheap and silly and stuff like that, so. And, um, and then we, we involved uh, makeup and costume. We involved Cher Fleming. It was funny, when I first read the script, the last city in the world I would have ever expected was Albuquerque. And when they told me that was one of the cities that they were thinking of, I was like, oh my God. Sorry sorry to anyone there in Albuquerque, but it just didn't read like this, you know, metropolitan city like Detroit or New York. And uh, initially I scouted with David Rubin. We went both to Albuquerque and then we went to New Orleans. And New Orleans was just re re trying to get back from uh, Katrina and there were so many buildings that were ready for us to take over that were devastated. But it was almost too easy and Albuquerque surprised me. I liked it better because it had more creative challenge. The interesting thing about shooting Gamer in Albuquerque was that um, the requirements of the script were such that to build a, t a city, you know, it, getting back to how we approach the movies and how we're able to do a lot with a little compared to other movies delivering a similar experience for a lot more money. We rely a lot on uh, practical locations. It had the uh, gypsum mine, which once I saw that, I was like, what a great location for a prison. And that was so surreal. And kind of the blankness of Albuquerque gave a bigger slate for us to do the things that I wanted to do. The problem with being good at anything is it kind of pigeonholes you like, um, oh, Jerry Fleming, he's, he's the guy who, who does great things on small budgets. But we're doing a big budget movie, so he's not the guy. Well, you know, he's, it's, he's, he can do those same things with a big budget, he can just do it better and more. It makes you really work hard to be creative, and, and Jerry's great at that. You know, we needed this city, and we're shooting in Albuquerque, and we wanted to shoot in New York City, and he came up with Container City. Uh, you know, pulling freight cars apart and building them up and, and giving it this, you know, sort, sort of futuristic feel um, and just this down and dirty urban feel and, and um, only a guy like Jerry can pull it off. The concept of condominiums with containers was just starting and I remember I came up with the idea and then I, I went to my place in the desert and got this, got to my PO box and there was a issue of Dwell and there in Dwell there was a picture of a condo in Europe 
uh, made of shipping containers. But I'd already come up with the idea, and I said, I don't care, I'm going to do it. The first time, I remember, the first time I arrived at Albuquerque, I was thinking, that's not going to work, not at all. I was there with Jerry, this, right in the middle of the road, and was thinking, and, and that's the battlefield. I, I was thinking, that's not going to work, not at all. And then Jerry was getting slightly nervous, and he was tr starting to explain what he wants to do and what he had in mind. And from this, I mean, it was an hour later. And from this time, I was thinking, that's, that's brilliant. It's kind of brilliant. Welcome to Container City. Uh, because Albuquerque is not a booming metropolis, we had to put in uh, four different buildings on this little intersection here. We're building sort of a little mini city that we can blow up. So, yeah, so this is Container City, we're hoping that we can, we can fuck it up really good. And, uh, you know, Battle 1 and Battle 4 takes place here. Matter, matter of fact, Battle 4, our truck that Gerard Butler is going to steal, is going to bust right out here and do this big 180 turn. To entertain you! That's to right. To entertain you! That's what we're here for. We're going to give you what you want! We wrote Gamer as a 3D movie. We yeah. were very excited about doing it as a 3D movie. Just uh, once uh, the numbers came in with a budget, it wasn't, it wasn't possible, and we were told. It was too early in the process. Yeah, by the studio that we couldn't do it. And, and really, the cameras weren't there to do it for the price and the way that we make movies. To be honest, it probably was a bit premature. You know, it, was, it was one thing to deal with the red camera and all the, the, um, the speed bumps involved with that you know, being so early in the process. To add stereoscopic to it would have been probably more than we uh, could have done at least safely, uh, but you know it was it was that kind of you know the, the, they're, they're that kind of directors. They really want to see, you know, what technology it can provide, what you know, what additional tools that puts in their toolbox for telling um, their stories. So uh, it's it's cool to work with those guys for that reason. And at the time we were going to do it, all that all that was really out there in 3D was this uh, you know like this YouTube concert film that they made that was very kind of static, slowly moving cameras and. It was just too complicated. You know, the budget we were at and the time that they expected us to shoot this movie in mm. and the style we wanted to shoot it in, it just wouldn't have been possible. But it would have been a great 3D movie. It would have been an awesome 3D movie. You know, because 3D movies this, this last year have done extremely well. There was, after we had finished and delivered the movie, there was conversation about whether or not we should, uh, it's called dimensionalize the movie. Basically, you, you cut out the, the, the parts of the frame that you want to move forward or move back and you create a separate eye and offset those cutout elements more or less than everything else to achieve a sense of, of 3D. So we, we, you know, there was conversation, should we dimensionalize Gamer? Uh, and that was obviously the directors had intended way back that the film should be in 3D and it, it probably didn't make sense at that time. Uh, so we, we went through the process of, of testing uh, doing that and we took, I don't know, a minute or two of the movie and dimensionalized it. When you think of Simon here, and then the world of the game behind him, and then the audience here, and everybody can kind of reach past everybody else, and things like We wanted everybody controlling everybody being controlled, right? Would've been good. Theater. Some of it's just spectacular. I mean, I have to say, the graphics, particularly, to see Simon's, you know, GUI, his interface, floating, you know, a foot in front of you is spectacular. You really feel immersed. You really feel like you're Simon in that room playing cable. We would have done it, but there weren't enough 3D theaters in the world uh, for the rest of this year to, to allow for that to happen. There, there's such a, a movement to do films in stereoscopic uh, and 3D that, that all the theaters that are capable of doing it were booked until Avatar, and then Avatar is going to book it, you know, I don't know how long that's going to run, but certainly until uh, into next year. So there really was no way we could, we could have done the work and it would probably have been spectacular, but there would have been no way to show anybody the work that we had done until, you know, some point in 2010. <laughs>Mark and Brian came to me with Gamer, they wanted to do stuff that no one had ever done before, you know, and they, that's kind of what everybody wants to do, you know, they want to, they want to do things that are bigger and better, and, but with those guys, their minds are so open to just, you really have to think outside the box, because they'll accept stuff that, you know, other directors will be like, well, that might not really be cool, and those guys just think, you know, cool on a different level. We had a pretty good shorthand with Darren. He knew us, you know, from working on Crank and, and Pathology. And while we were shooting certain scenes on the first and second week, Darren was out there doing tests. A lot of times, um, I will, I'll come up with an idea for a stunt, 
and I'll present it to them. And in my mind, I think it'll work. <laughs> but then there's a part where, so, you know, I have to go out and prove it and make sure to myself, number one, and then obviously to them, because I, I don't want them to show up on the day and then go, you know, this didn't work at all, this is horrible. And he'd bring us some crappy video footage of uh, Frosty uh, doing some ridiculous stunt, and uh, he would always give us like two or three options. Do you like it this way or this way? And For a lot of the match cut sequences, we went into the warehouse and we'd actually set up like the beam fall. I mean, when we started doing that, we did a high fall, and then we built just a beam out of cardboard and duct tape and stuff, and then put that up there and had them break through it, and then we skipped them off a real beam. And I shot it all, and then I, you know, I cut it on Final Cut and blend it all together. And, you know, we don't have all the luxuries that we'll have on the day, but if I can make it look, if the concept works with us shooting it and cutting it ourselves, then obviously, you know, when the professionals get there and can tie it all together, it'll just make it that much better. Oh, so that's a match? It's a match cut for the real guy. It's, it's going to look better. And again, I'm dealing with light issues. So you just have a pad there and we just take the pad out? It's uh, basically what happens is, is he jumps. When he jumps, this beam is cardboard. Yeah. Jerry's going to make me a foam beam. Okay. He jumps and smashes through it. Wham. Right? Then we pick him back up. We hang him above the beam. Got it. I didn't have the time to hang him. You can see his body position's off. And the light changes in the day. And then just let him go. I'd like him to be more, I wanted him to be more forward and catch it on his thigh. So he hit it and didn't go completely head over, kind of went sideways and ragged all the half of it. And a lot of times when I present these things, if I'm not quite sure if it's gonna go, I'll say, listen, this is an idea. I think it'll work. It'll be really cool if it does, but we gotta test it. But then the beautiful part of it is that on the day, you're, it's already done, you know? It's like a, almost like a pre or something, so they know what they have exactly, and it, it works out really good, and then I don't have to sweat if it's gonna work or it's not gonna work. We'd get there on set and then we'd completely fuck it up and not do it anything like uh, Darren uh, sort of uh, uh, choreographed it to be, but this is the great thing about Darren. Darren just rolls with our bullshit and he makes it happen lightning fast. Uh, his guys all just love to, to work that fast and work spontaneously and that's kind of how we work. It, it's hard for us to, to think ahead too far because uh, we like to be in the moment when we're shooting and uh, Darren's the, the only guy I think that can, can pull it off in real time with us and, and now it and keep people safe, you know, doing these ridiculous stunts. With a film like this that has so much action, so many people, so many different departments have to come together and work together to make sure it all flows smoothly. I mean, a lot of it depends on the AD department and John Mallard and the guys that worked for him were solid and they have to be on top of it and make sure that, you know, when we do our rehearsals and we do all our walkthroughs that they see everybody and there's nobody that's, you know, not paying attention or something because they could inadvertently walk by a mortar or something like that and really get peppered. So for any of those given battles, and so many people, so much carnage and so many stunts, uh, for any of those given battles, we had a laundry list of like, man, 50 things that we'd like to do. At the end of the day, we're only gonna be able to do 10 or 12 of them. But these are the 50 we'd like to do. And then as the days developed, it was just run and gun. You know, we're trying to get this battle scene and Darren's coming, he's like, what about this one? What about this one? What about this one? Mm, yeah, set it up, set it up. We'll try to get it, we'll try to get it. Meanwhile, we're doing another one over here and. Uh, it was just so fast, and then we'd run over and see what he, what he was doing. He said, okay, we got this guy, we got him on a line, he gets shot, boom, his head hits the ground, it's disgusting, what do you think? Yeah, 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 we can do it, we can do it. Bring everybody over here, let's shoot it, let's shoot it. And it was just like that. Where you would normally have, you know, uh, a week to do a certain sequence, we would kind of do it in a day, or a couple of days, you know, which is, uh, uh, which was difficult, but without, you know, without all these groups, you know, uh, um, Lars and his effects team and Guillaume and, and, and the prop guys with the weapons and, and Darren and, and all the stunt guys. Everyone was just always on board and, and for me it became easy because there was never really a negative uh, factor in it. Uh, everyone was ready, yeah, let's do it, let's try it. The first battle in the movie in the train station, I mean, didn't we shoot that whole battle, I want to say in like two days? Yeah. Was it two days or three days? Two days. It was like ridiculous. When you look at that battle and the amount of Stunts, the amount of explosions, the amount of guys just getting assholed off of walls and pulled on cables and their heads blown off and falling out of the rafters and bouncing down and just taking bullet hits and stuff. 
you know, you have to double check this, but I'm pretty sure we shot, I mean, we definitely shot 95% of that, minus a few little isolated pickups in two days. It essentially was like uh, being in the Kentucky Derby, you know, standing barefoot and, and running at full speed from, from the very first moment. And we had, uh, I think our second day, we had 250 extras with gunfire and with mortars, and almost every shot we had, um, um, you know, 10 or 12 explosions. Um, so it's, it's just massive all the time. I mean, it's one thing to say it's planned out, <laughs> you know, but if your plan is like, yeah, he's gonna come from here, there's gonna be five explosions, and he's gonna come down here, 50 guys are gonna die, he's gonna go up there, then we're gonna get the cameraman up in the air on a wire, shooting down with a giant explosion over here, 50 guys are gonna get knocked into this thing. I mean, it's one thing to plan it out and say like, yeah, this is the plan, but if the plan is completely absurd, I mean, if the plan is like, yeah, I'm gonna uh, strip naked and uh, run into Fort Knox and take all the gold and run out. Well, that's my plan. It doesn't, it doesn't mean it's like a, it doesn't mean it's an achievable plan. And our plan, you know, we, had, we definitely had a plan for, for those battle scenes, but once we actually got in there and saw the kind of like scope of what we were doing, then the plan kind of goes out the window. And at that point, you're just like trying to, you're just trying to get cool shit, as much cool shit as you can possibly get in the time. And you're just like, you know, every, you're just pushing. I mean, it really felt like despite the budget and the scope and all the extras and the, and the pyro and the effects and all that stuff, it really felt at the end of the day like we were shooting, like we were running and gunning and shooting crank. Just yeah. Shooting a student film, you know? It's Basically. like 4th of July. You know the fireworks are gonna go off. You know the general vicinity. You just gotta make sure you get the camera right and ready for the shot. That's really how it was with all the explosions in the battle scenes. It was just like 4th of July, only <laughs> as if the fireworks were aimed at the audience yeah. <laughs> instead of the sky. You know, I'll watch the main beats of action, but my team of guys are so solid, they know that they've got to go out and be proactive and, you know, keep everybody safe because uh, that's number one, that absolutely flawless safety record. So I'd like to keep that going. This is for the medic. Let it drip. All, all, all over. Let it drip. Okay. Let it drip. Put some right there. Medic, thank you. Yeah. Oh, put some down. Uh, oh, fuck! <laughs> <laughs> Look, I've been in the department for 20 uh, years. I hurt I myself. <laughs> you hurt yourself. Oh, my God! Can you fucking believe that? I didn't know he was standing there. I didn't know he was standing there either. That's how good a joke we are. Is there another medic on set? No. Is there not another medic? No. How did you do that? What? I just, I hurt myself fighting Terry. Yeah, how do you do that? Well, I just, I got it. I got when I grabbed his down. knife, you know, he's got that false knife, but I fucking. It's on the rubber knife? Yeah. The rubber yeah, well, it's not rubber, but there's something sharp on there. That's sliced me. Jerry, you're not watching. Go back, go back, go back, go back. Look at this. We got cut-ups. Hey, Jerry, oh, we're yeah. starting. Shit, you're right, dude, that's bad. Yeah. Where's the medic? Oh, this is sharp. He's right. It's like one thing. I'm probably going to have to. It's real, bro. Yeah, it's not a jelly. You should probably get some stitches on that. It's completely separate. Yeah. Did you get it? Oh, wait a minute, where'd it go? You're an animal. Wait a minute. Wait a minute, that's jelly. That's so funny. It's jelly. It looked like jelly. It looked like jelly. It looked like jelly. It's not for one second. Not for one second. We also had Christian Tinsley running in and working with us to try to figure out, okay, well, how's the blood going to look? Look, What's the head crack going to look like? What do I need to put on this guy for bullet wounds? We're working so fast with these guys, and Christian, of course, did Passion of the Christ, and he's the master of uh, special effects this way. You know, every time you approach a film, <laughs> you, uh, you, know, you, you, you sit down, you talk to the producers, you talk to the directors, you try to establish sort of a system as much as possible. Uh, Mark and Brian are definitely unique directors and have their own way of working unlike any other director or production I've worked with. Christian, what he does, he's an artist. He needs time to work on these uh, special effects, makeup, you know, pieces and prosthetics. We don't give anybody time. We run and gun and we don't have time. You know, we're trying to knock out a, uh, what should be a 120 day shoot in, in 49, 50 days. So we, we get to a set, we take a look at it, and we say, okay, we need you know, 12 dead bodies here. We're going to shoot this guy in the head. He's going to drop here. And we need to shoot this scene in 20 minutes because we've got lunch in 50, you know, 25 minutes. If we don't make it to lunch, we're going to go overtime, and we don't have overtime. We don't have a contingency on this movie. We have to make our days, have to make our numbers. And when you're creating something from scratch, you want to design it and build it all there and then on the spot, which in reality takes months of prep time and creation. And we didn't really have that luxury here, so we took sort of an organic approach to it, and we created these, these buckets of 
silicone that we didn't cure all the way. So it's very gooey, it resembles uh, raw meat if you've pulverized it. And we created a, a fatty tissue bucket, a brain matter bucket, and a raw meat bucket. And we sort of, we built these different systems and by mixing it with different colors, um, we were able to slap it on to our prosthetic bodies that we built and create a new look of carnage that was very organic and natural because it wasn't pre-sculpted, it wasn't pre-thought. And uh, you get something new. And Christian was able to you know, put bullet wounds on people and, and crack guys' heads open and take dummies from his truck and lay them out all over you know, uh, the streets and intersections of Albuquerque and make it look real and gruesome to the point where people were in their offices in Albuquerque not knowing what the hell's going on and they thought, you know, September 11th happened. Yeah, they were, they were vomiting into trash cans. You know, they were, they were, uh... You're counting down to shoot. It's like three, two, one, and you got Jason Hamer and Tinsley out there with their butt, with their gut, you know, gut buckets, like splashing yeah. entrails around the streets of Albuquerque. It was amazing. They're like, this is a trauma film we're making right now. This is you amazing. Know? Can't say I didn't try. Guillaume's like a, he's worked with us in every movie. He's kind of like a gun fanatic. He's obsessed with weaponry and it's perfect for this. Probably a serial killer. Definitely. These weapons come from a supplier in California called Independent Studio Services. Uh, we have an armory there that boasts a collection of over 10,000 weapons. Uh, every era uh, from basically uh, uh, um, silex, uh, black powder, uh, muskets, all the way to these. Okay, so the balance of the weapons on, on this movie is, it's a little bit futuristic, but at the same time, it's not laser guns. You don't want the weapons to be so futuristic and sci-fi that they don't feel like they hurt. And that they're too style, yeah. I mean, so we want it to feel like real military style, you know, Israeli commando, kind of like hardcore, gnarly, violent weapons. We started with basic concepts of you know known uh, firearms and then we evolved into something more futuristic our greatest example of this is hackman's weapon um, this was a challenge because um, we'd never really this doesn't exist we made two of these and we basically started with a russian made shotgun it's based on the ak-47 platform with the paddle and we modified it to give it a bolt stop uh, it's a 12 gauge, fully automatic, um, short barrel shotgun that utilizes a 20 round drum. These are dummy rounds, by the way. These are safe, inert uh, rounds that have no powder in them. They just look cosmetically accurate uh, for a scene if you see a gun being loaded. Um, so this is uh, Hackman's hero gun. It's very um, emblematic, very symbolic for him. Um, the actor loves it. Uh, he fired it a couple of times last week. There's a lot of uh, engineering that had to be done to make this weapon function at this rate of fire, which I think is 350 rounds per minute uh, with this weapon. This is quite possibly the most illegal weapon ever. It's a fully automatic short barrel shotgun. So, and it comes from California. We had this gun we were researching on the internet and we, I, I love Browning shotguns and uh, Browning weapons. And we found this 1920 uh, Browning and, and we just loved the style of it. And it uh, almost looked like a Gatling gun. It's a big a cylindrical cylinder, tube. You know, holding all the ammo. And we wanted to recreate this gun and Guillaume did. It was, it was a World a, War One era yeah, thing, right? Yeah, took an AK-47 and you know, they, they uh, drilled a bunch of holes in this, this metal cylinder and wrapped it around the gun and made it look like this, gave it the sort of old browning feel. And, and this particular gun, the guys liked the fact that it was still a little compact. This is the paratrooper version with a um, collapsible stock. And we, what we did is to get this big tube, we ended up using the longer version barrel. We mounted the barrel on this, built this shroud so it could be fired either shoulder or from the hip or even, we thought, one-handed. We wanted to use this Cable's gun. We thought it was totally badass. It was huge. It's like this is the perfect weapon for the hero of Slayers to, to carry around. The only problem is when they got done with the gun, 
and they handed it to Jerry, his hands dropped and hit the floor. <laughs> there are so many battles that Kibble's involved with, it became this just cumbersome piece. Uh, so we, we, when the guys cast a UFC champion, we decided that that would be his gun. But we love the gun so much, we, we ended up giving it to uh, Keith Jardine to hold. So you see it in the movie, that's the, the gigantic gun that, that the mean prisoner. That was supposed to be the, the cable team. upgrade gun. So you'll see it. Of course, he wielded the thing like it was a, a water gun. At your leisure. Fire in the hole, guys. Fire in the hole. Going, walk with it. Guillaume is a silent genius, you know? He loves firing guns, you know, and he loves, which is even better, you firing guns. Like, he's the kind of guy, rather than go, oh, watch this, I'll show you, he's like, go on, fire this big fucking thing, you know? And the next minute, you're smiling, boom, 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 He's just a trip, he's a fun guy to work with, and he always has ideas for you. He's also a guy who's, my life is in his hands. Every day, he gives me a gun. Even though it's pretend, playing war, and so forth, they're still real weapons. Uh, we plug the barrel so that the blanks will function, will make the uh, blowback action work. Uh, but basically at close range, these weapons can kill. They've killed before, they can. Uh, so we have to make sure no one gets hurt. Uh, even if it's, you know, um, as little as just a little powder burn, it's still considered a failure in our world. We're not supposed to injure anyone doing this. So uh, we're very, very uh, strict on safety distances and um, setting up shooters and choreographing each shot very important that no one gets hurt. Safety is critical and the producer bears some responsibility for safety. I'll tell you I, I, I don't do it on every movie because not every movie is as dangerous to make as the game was in terms of uh, keeping people out of out of accidents but at the end of the movie I wrote uh, personal letters to um, to Lars Anderson to Guillaume Delouche and to uh, Darren Prescott thanking them for doing such a great job on the movie and, and complimenting them that no one got hurt. And I don't do that all the time, but I, I did it on this movie. Yeah, the Fernando and Doobie team, that was like a godsend. We had Fernando uh, working on Crank 2, and uh, we saw the work he was doing. He's just, just, he got our style. It was something cool, something original that he was, he was putting into his work, and we wanted to put him on Gamer. So we actually, um, I think we stopped a little bit of Crank to, to see what he could do on Gamer, and then we put him back on Crank to finish that off. Well, I started Crank first, so, um because the guys shot Gamer, then they shot Crank, and then the, the, and so then I jumped on Gamer just a little bit after the director's cut on, on, on Crank. So it was really fast. It was, it was, because we had to deliver Gamer, I think in the early part of the year, January-ish, right? So then we had to finish that really fast. Because then I had to go into a mix and do all, all, all that stuff. And, um, and, and then the Crank deadline wasn't to turn it in, wasn't that much later. So it was just nonstop. And we knew that he had the, you know, he just had that, he had that eye for, for what we needed. He knew what to do with the battle scenes. He knew what to do with the storytelling. And he also had this guy in his pocket, Doobie White, who he said, look, I'm gonna bring this guy in. He's gonna make your action scenes look like they're right out of a fucking video game. This guy's gonna knock it out of the park. Just trust me, this guy's name's Doobie. And we're just thinking like, Doobie? Like, you know, all right, we'll, we'll give the guy a shot. There was definitely an idea that the battles, they, you know, wanted it to feel like a game, you know? And I, I don't, you know, if mm -hmm. you played first person shooters, I don't know if you guys have, but I played quite a few and if you play them for the first time they're crazy I mean you know it's like you get used to it you know but like you're you're out there there's bombs going off it's 5-1 now so there's shit going everywhere and and uh and that's kind of like what we wanted to make it I, I think it was like halfway through the day the guy got through battle one and he put all the glitches in the scene and the just sound made feel the sound and he works great with sound and, and editing and just it just blew us away we couldn't believe how it elevated these battle scenes. We started coming up with a concept of like that there would be a delay in this in like the the player seeing the the screen and so like these these glitches started coming into play and started building upon that. He's a freak of nature. You know, and fa fans of Crank 2 will 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 see similarities between some of the scenes he did in Crank 2 like the limo shootout. You know, it's definitely got his stamp on it. Um, 
but yeah, I mean, man, he would, he would blast through these battle scenes doing his own little CG and his own temp sound that was as good as the final sound and just these incredibly intricate edits with a thousand cuts in them and he would do it in a day and a half just sitting in there with his headphones, you know, listening to Alice in Chains or whatever the hell he does. And the heavy impact of the editing and, 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 and the sound design right. and, and uh, all the glitches and all, all that stuff, they, I think they add to the experience. I think they add to the experience of, be, of you know, somebody being in, in that world and not be able to control what he's doing. Because you know, these guys, you know, they're being controlled by other people. So, right. so it's just the loss of control. And I, I, think, um, I, I think it lended itself really well to that. So, but that was all him. Oh, no, that that's not true. I mean, we definitely, I mean, that's what was great about working with Fern. But, you know, we'd, we just bounced stuff off each other. So it was like, it, you know, I would do something and then I'd be, I'd show it to Fern and he'd be like, awesome, let's, let's do this, you know? So it was, a, I felt like it was always just a collaborative thing and it, it made it so much fun because as an editor, sometimes you're so alone, you know? We have him in one room and at the other, you know, the other room is, is Fernando who basically helped rewrite Gamer at the end of the day because Gamer was an incredibly ambitious movie. We were not able to shoot all the scenes that we wrote in the original script. We didn't have the money to do it. So we had to kind of piece things together and, and sort of you know, make the circle work. And Fernando's in there just kind of rewriting and reworking the movie for us and showing us things and ideas that we didn't originally have and it was just cool. He just had this great sensibility about storytelling when really he didn't have all the pieces of the story. We didn't have a lot of time to kind of you know, mess around. So yeah, we just kind of soldiered through and, and, um, and, and Mark and Brian are great to work with. They're like really in incredible as far as being um, uh, just really enthusiastic and, um, and yeah, giving us great direction. Part. Yeah, and and they're very clear about what they like. They're very clear about what kind of movie they're making and, and what the scenes are about. And uh, and spe especially that knowing what the scenes are about, you, you know, like specifically what needs to what needs to happen, what emotion you need to get out of it, and um, and. And then we just do our thing at, at that point. Yeah, there's really so. no, I mean, if they like something, they like it, and it's great, and they're enthusiastic, and if they don't like it, there's no hem and hawn. It's like, let's move on, let's just get through it. So, And we didn't have time to be like, you know, oh, good job, but, you know, <laughs> they're like, let's just go. No, that, pull that, what you're doing this way, let's go, let's go that way. And the great thing about Fernando is we contacted him for Crank 2 because we thought he was a music video commercial guy who was gonna bring all this flash in an attitude and a little bag of tricks, you know. Um, but what we found is the, the amazing thing about his editing is it's, it's completely intuitive and it's all about emotion and all about story and all about character. And he found emotional moments and ways of constructing it where he could pull more story out of the scenes. It was the last thing we thought we would get from him, but it was actually the most important thing that we got from him. Um, and then all of, the, all of the fun stuff on the surface, that just became the icing, you know, on the cake. We we had intended to shoot it widescreen. But when we, when we got the footage in at the end of the day and started editing it, there was just a lot of good stuff happening up here and down here that we, we didn't want to leave out of the movie. <laughs> it was that simple. I mean, uh, there was just good stuff happening down here and there was great stuff happening up there. And The dailies came in uh, and they were 16 by 9 and they were being cut on a 16 by 9 monitor. And the directors got used to, Mark and Brian got used to seeing it uh, 16 by 9 in the, during the post process. So we went to do, I think, our first test and we put a hard mat, 240 hard mat on the picture, and they said, well, this isn't the movie we've been cutting, and when we said, well, this is the movie that was shot, uh, do you want to change it? And they said, yeah, we'd like to go, we'd like to be 16 by nine. It happens in the uh, edit room, the edit suite. They were watching all the time the full size of the chips, of the sensors, and the full size is 16 by nine. And they finally said, it looks great. And it, it doesn't, it, it fits better to this kind of story. The way that we shoot, which is this very run and gun, there's a lot of handheld in the movie and a lot of very quickly captured stuff on the fly with explosions and running and stuff like that. And it really does not lend itself to widescreen. 
you really need to be sucking up as much of the picture as you possibly can just to make sure that you're seeing all the stuff that happens. You know, and the widescreen look is a lot better suited to things that where the camera's just not moving so wildly. And that's what we found at the end of the day, that even when our intention was to shoot it one way, at the end of the day, it's just these images were, were, were too big all around to be sort of perfectly composed into this, into this widescreen box. It just didn't work. It didn't feel good. I was surprised, <laughs> to tell you the truth. And I was watching the movie only looking at this, only at the framing and stuff like that. But uh, yeah, two scenes. They were a little off frame, but off frame sometimes looks really modern. <laughs> sometimes. The big concern was because 235 is a narrower format, a narrower aspect ratio than 185. The concern was that there would be things appearing top and bottom of frame that the DP had you know, simply framed uh, with the expectation that that part of the frame wouldn't be visible in the final, uh, in the final movie. Uh, and we'd have to do a lot of painting out and cleaning up. But for whatever reason, we lucked out. It really actually wasn't much in there that had to be fixed. Uh, there was a little bit of DI repoing that had to, to, to be done to make that format work. But it wasn't because there was things in the frame. It was just because that's technically what's required to achieve that. So we, we lucked out. I mean, I've, I've done movies where you do, we would do a video master, for instance, and you'll, and you'll you know, it's a 240 show, and suddenly you're looking at, and you take that 240 mask off the, uh, or man off the, uh, off the picture and you have you know crew members and track and you know you know people eating donuts in the bottom of the frame uh, and you have to be, take all that stuff out before you can release it and we had none of that kind of stuff yeah we weren't sure how the hell they're gonna pull off all the the VFX that we needed for gamer um, the budget was tiny I mean the limitations were almost comical you know we're going against movies um, the same coming out same summertime as us where their CG budget is more than our entire budget you know movies with CG budgets of 50 60 70 80 million dollars just for just for their CG we had about a million bucks a million bucks for all of those shots if you look at the the, the scale of gamer for the budget we we had to work with it, it doesn't make any sense. You know, if it was a, a big studio making a movie, it would have been, there's just, there's no way this is possible. But between taking advantage of some technologies, working with uh, directors who are willing to figure out how to work within a budget, and, and just generally having a great, you know, a team who can make the most from very little, uh, we were able to put on the screen what you, what you see now. But, uh, but it really sort of starts with those guys. I mean, they really are great at, you know, taking, you know, a tiny amount of money and making it seem quite a bit larger than it should have other, otherwise, or in the hands of another director, a lesser director, a lesser director than team, would have seemed like a lot less than what they were able to accomplish. When we were shooting, we did our best to shoot everything and keep everything in camera as much as we could, but there's things like composites and uh, Simon's interface, um, and you always want to have a little blood enhancement and always a little explosion enhancement. Mark and Brian wanted to put as much practical uh, battle on screen as they possibly could so a lot of the explosions and the obviously the the snow plows flipping over things like that are, are practical uh, but then there's only so much you can do you can't have tracer rounds flying by actors heads you can't have I mean some actors you can put on fire but some you can't so you have to add flames or uh, you know missiles can't fly around um, the helicopters uh, uh, in, in several of the shots are are added in CG you know so those sorts of things we we, we added just to make the battle seem uh, bigger and louder uh, uh, than you could ever imagine accomplishing practically. Uh, we also did, we shot in Albuquerque, which is a relatively low city. Uh, most buildings are not more than three, four stories high. And they wanted it to feel more like, uh, you, know, we, you know, obviously Blade Runner is the obvious touchstone for the movie. We wanted, they wanted that kind of sense of uh, New York or, or downtown Los Angeles or something. So there's a lot of extension just to make Albuquerque kind of look a little bit different than Albuquerque typically looks and to give the film and give the shots a bit more scale, a little more height to them. So there's a whole you know, group of shots we did like that. Probably the most challenging part of the whole VFX, uh, uh, you know, all the VFX work we did was uh, the graphics work. You know, the graphics in this movie, it's not, typically in movies, graphics are just eye candy. You know, there are some exceptions. Minority Report jumps to mind as like, you know, the greatest graphics that I can think of ever seeing. Uh, but typically it's just, you know, it, it maybe has a, a basic idea that it has to convey, but usually it's just to look cool and, and, you know, in this movie we really had to tell the world, because of the budget limitations, we couldn't necessarily have, 
you know, cars flying around and all the kind of things you expect from a futuristic movie. So the graphics had to sort of convey the sense of the future uh, in a relatively inexpensive way. And it also had to sort of explain the rules of the game. I mean, the graphics, you know, whether it's the, the interface that uh, Simon is playing, you know, when he, uh, or inter interacting with when he plays uh, Cable, or the graphics for Gina Parker Smith's uh, sequence, where we sort of explain the whole rules of the game. The graphics had to be, you know, obviously fun to look at, but they had to, you know, have narrative. Uh, that uh, that if, it, if, it, if the graphics didn't convey that narrative, the audience would be lost. They wouldn't understand that they would take, you know, 30, if you could survive 30 Slayers battles, you would uh, be set free. I mean, those kinds of very basic ideas uh, are contained almost exclusively in the graphics. We worked initially, and you know, I, I was having heavy dialogue with with you and company. And then, you know, after filming ends, you know, we move on, and, and they took over. But pretty much a lot of our concepts, you know, got conveyed. But they did a brilliant job of coming up with the, the graphics. To, to get that accomplished was, you know, really maybe the most difficult thing I've ever done. I mean, it's in some ways it's easier to do have you know werewolves running around or something like that than it is because you kind of know you kind of know what the werewolf looks like and you have to go from point A to point B and it's, you know, it's pretty much a, uh, I don't want to say technical ex exercise because there's a lot of creativity and art that goes into it, but with graphics it's like, you know, it's, it's so subjective. James McQuaid was great. He came in and was able to subcontract out as much as he possibly could to all these different companies and you and company was sort of the leader of it all and um, they did an amazing job for, I mean, for a million bucks, all the shots that they put in this movie. It was kind of uh, unbelievable and incredible, um, and it was this. This was just an ambitious movie. Um, and it kind of screws things up for other movies now. Yeah, you know, because when they see everything that we got done, then they look at their movie and they're just like, "What did you guys waste uh, that extra fifty million dollars for? Look at these guys did it for a million bucks." Traditionally, movie has one director also, but we have Brian and Mark, they work as a team and um, I, I guess I don't really know how their process is, but I'd imagine it's similar in that each one has, you know, a, diff a different idea, a different skill set or something that when they, you know, come together, it's, it's fascinating. We needed sort of a standard score, like a classical score. Uh, so we needed a classical score on parts of Gamer. I think that was important and uh, we had Robbie Williamson and, and Jeff. Uh, come in and uh, they both have different backgrounds too. I mean, it was neat to have these guys that are totally different. Robbie's got this cool alternative aesthetic to his music and Jeff has this, you know, he has this classic rock but also just but classical Yeah, he's too. like a traditional composer. Traditional composer. He's, you know, he's edgy but he's a traditional guy. And we knew that we needed one guy like him who would really kind of like ground it and make it feel like a movie. And then Robbie became kind of like the wild card, kind of like the doobie, the freak. If you're looking for something specific in the movie, like the, when you first see Society, that's, it would never have come out of my head that way. You know what I mean? And it's like this perfect little piece of music that sets the tone for that whole, so yeah, that whole, you know, the whole side of the story. Movie. I simply couldn't have done it that way, you know. And so we would never have gotten there if it wasn't if it wasn't a collaborative thing, you know. Um, but I really think that yeah, it was just he he's a really he's really good at making things sound huge. It wasn't a strict uh, it wasn't a strict division of labor. They would cross over, and Robbie ended up doing some very beautiful uh, uh, movie type stuff, and then Jeff ended up doing some kind of like the hard rock kind of cues. We were in the rooms next to each other, so he'd write something and I'd listen. I'd write something he'd listen and. We'd trade um, uh, music back and forth all the time. I think it was... Um, Before we started, yeah. too, we, I think we took a day and just listened to each other's work yep. and saw what our strengths were. And um, I think we were really lucky in the sense that we just, it just flowed. Just like, you take this scene, I'll take this scene. And then eventually, once we got like 20 scenes into it, 
we would take elements from each other's scene and put them together and make stuff, which was really cool. My favorite thing from Jeff was the piano in uh, the scene where Jerry turns around and the truck's flying by him. My favorite uh, music from Robbie is definitely in um, the scene with, with Milo and Amber when she comes into the Thorax bar. They seem uh, very much in tune with, you know, the, you can feel it, it's part of the grit of the film, you know, they, they live that life, if that, you know. Yeah. It's... And they, like when we're playing stuff back for them, especially Brian, you know, there might be a synth in there that's really hidden ten layers deep and he can point it out and say, no, you should do that different. So, and that's pretty rare. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're, they're hip, musically, for sure. Yeah. This movie is like a perfect movie for, for the Blu-ray generation. There's so much shit going on in this movie. When you watch it in the theater, you're probably only getting 30% of what's in the movie. I, it's cut so fast and maybe to a fault, maybe too fast, you know. Um, but there's a lot of attention to detail in the movie. And we don't think that the movie really shines until you get all those details. The richness of the world. If you're just looking at sort of the surface of the movie, it is what it is. It's a throwback 80s action movie. You know, and it's fun, and it's violent, and it's crazy, and it's all those things. But if you watch it two and three times, you'll see more and more in it that you might have missed. And all the winks in our movie too. You know, movies like The Running Man, The Matrix, and, and then, you know, way back, uh, movies from the 70s. You'll, you'll see all the, the great little seeds that gave us this movie game. I have to be in this scene, but it's up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I turned. How was that? That's outstanding. <laughs> That's a good angle. I mean, is that going to work? <laughs> That's not funny. Let your heart. That's, uh, it's, it's totally, it's totally busy. <laughs> what was that? <laughs> was that real? Did I, did I dream that? All three of the movies we've made, we shot with different cameras and never a normal orthodox system that the studios were used to. So there's always this process at the beginning of the movie where it's kind of like you're inventing the wheel and you have to convince them 
that this is a legitimate way to shoot a movie. Um, you explain what you want to do, and you can explain all you want, but at the end of the day, they're, they're looking at you like, you're crazy, we don't shoot movies this way, we shoot movies on Panavision 35 millimeter cameras, that's what, we, that's what we shoot movies on. So we've always had to go through this process of doing tests, filming them out, bringing executives into a screening room and showing them the footage and just saying like, don't, don't look at the words on the paper, trust your eyes, look what you're seeing on the screen. Doesn't that look amazing? And they say, wow, that really does look amazing. What did you shoot that on? And we say, don't worry about it, you know? Um, but there's a lot of great reasons why we want to shoot it on this particular system for this particular movie. And this was no exception. We're at NAB sort of there supporting another um, company. And yeah. while we were there at this big booth, a uh, very big company, while we were there at their booth, sort of helping them out, and they were using clips from, our, uh, you know, from Crank uh, to sort of show off uh, their system. And uh, we saw this big banner for the Red One system and just the fucking everything about it, the advertising, the, just the look of the, their posters look cool. The founder of the company is a gentleman named Jim Gennard, who uh, some people might have heard of. He also founded another company that a lot of people know called Oakley, the sunglass and apparel and sportswear company, which has become quite a large company, uh, 30 years in the, in the making of that. And uh, I guess we're talking about five years ago now, um, he had the inkling of creating a digital movie camera um, essentially out of frustration. The, the best ideas typically when you talk about invention and innovation come from frustration. So Jim is a avid uh, photographer both still and motion and he saw sort of an alarming trend of what was happening with um, motion capture uh, as compared to still capture. So um, there were a lot of things going on correctly with the transition from film to digital in the still side, from film, uh, 35 millimeter film still cameras to digital still cameras, which have now pretty much overtaken the entire industry for still imagery. Um, but what was happening on the moving picture side was cameras were drifting into becoming all video type cameras. At that time, it had, the camera hadn't come out yet and they were just a bunch of promises and everybody was looking at the promises coming out of the Red Company and this, this, you know, this sort of like mad scientist invention that supposedly would do everything. It's a little tiny camera, it shoots 4K, you know, you can put compact flash cards in it and it's this, it's that, you know, it uses 35 millimeter lenses and everybody's looking at it like, come on, you know, this thing doesn't really work. You know, these are just a set of like specifications that you dreamed up that you couldn't possibly meet. Put together a team of engineers, put together all the, the brains and the strategic people to help us make it real and uh, went on our way, launched the project um, in um, early 2006, went public with it in the spring of 2006 at a big trade show in Las Vegas, announced that we were building a 4K movie camera, a digital movie camera at a very affordable price point that would uh, if we did our job right, uh, completely changed the industry. So there was tons of skepticism about that camera at the time, and we were as skeptical as anybody else. We just wanted to see the, see the footage, and we ended up going down to the red booth where they were showing this footage that Peter Jackson had shot, uh, this little, the military kind of like mini movie that he made to demo the cameras. And there's a line around the block as if it was like a rock concert of people trying to get in to see this red footage. I mean, it was exciting, right? And we didn't want to wait in line, so we just kind of like, we tried to see if we had any kind of like rock star card we could play. And we just said, you know, just throwing it out there, you know, we're the guys who did Crank. I don't know if that means anything to, to the red guys. Maybe they hate it, you know, they probably hate it, but just, just tell them. And Jim Gennard, the guy who invented the red camera, you know, the main man comes running out. He's like, ah, I love that movie, Crank. You're the Crank guys? We were like, yeah, yeah, great, great. <laughs> wow, we actually got something out of this, you know, and, and he, he brought us in uh, and we got to just look at this footage um, first run, you know, 10 seconds into seeing this stuff on a big screen, you're just like, wow, I mean, all, the whole game has just changed. The thing about the RED camera, the RED 1 camera, which is our first camera that we built, uh, that is groundbreaking, as it were, um, is that it's not a video camera. It's actually not a video camera at all. If you think about it like a video camera, you've already gone down the wrong track. What it is, is a movie camera that records these very, very high resolution progressive frames, similar to how a film movie camera works, where it records this very large 
high density, high resolution still image that happens to be moving at 24 frames a second. In our case, we do a digital version of that. So we actually make a raw capture device. Um, there are a lot of uh, connections and tie points to the digital still world with the RED because a digital still camera is effectively a raw capture device, at least the high-end ones are. And what we did is we watched and learned from that sort of logic and liked what they were doing, didn't like what traditional video cameras were doing, but said if we could make a camera that was more like a digital still camera that shot movies, that was designed to shoot movies, then we might be onto something. You know, this stuff looks better than 35 to my eye and it's a thousand times easier to shoot. It's cheaper. I mean, the whole camera body was under 20,000 bucks. The HD cameras we used on Crank 1 were a quarter million dollars for a camera. A quarter million dollars. And you had a big cable hanging off of the thing, going back to a, I mean, the kind of things we had to go through. The whole system was like 62 pounds. It was a joke. It's we were amazing. breaking our backs on the thing. On top of Red being a, a business as a, as a movie camera company, we we're quite passionate about what we do. So the business is, believe it or not, some people may not actually believe what I'm saying, but it's true, is actually a secondary concern for us. What, what we are most motivated by is making the best imaging tools in the industry and the most evolved workflow for those tools. That's what gets us excited. That's what keeps us up all day and all night working on stuff. It just didn't seem like there was any compromise at all. Any way you looked at it, you were just like, well, where's the compromise? I mean, surely for this kind of convenience and price, we're gonna compromise image quality. But no, the image quality is actually better. It, it just didn't make any sense at all. And uh, so, you know, we knew that this thing was gonna blow up and we wanted to be at the front. We wanted to be at the forefront. We were, you know, one of the first, if not the first, major movie to shoot with the RED camera. I think we tested with camera serial number th three and four of memory serves. Um, so that was quite, you know, a, a sort of technical uh, concern initially was, you know, how well was that camera going to work? What kind of image quality could we get? I was testing the camera. The uh, it wasn't the first. It wasn't the first camera. It was still the beta beta version of of the red camera. He really gave those red cameras a workout, and he didn't like them at first. You know, he had a natural DP's sort of like, a, you know, gut level distrust of, of, of digital. I prefer film, of course, because I grew up with that. But I see it as a, as another choice, another challenge, like another stock. Kodak announces another stock, and uh, here it is. It's called Red. <laughs> he didn't like these Red cameras. He didn't trust the specifications they were giving him. You know, the, the red guys would tell him, these cameras shoot at 320 ASA. He never bought it for a second. He went through and tested all of them. He says, no, it doesn't shoot at 320 ASA. You know, it's, this one's 250, this one's 125. He went through and he rated each camera and he put little stickers on them. And the red guys were, the red guys, when they saw what he was doing, the red guys all got pissed off. And they said, like, the way he's shooting these cameras is completely wrong. You guys are going to lose all your detail. We said, D you know, we, we trust our guy. We trust that car. We trust you guys, too. We trust you guys to make the camera. And we trust him to expose the cameras. At the end of the day, when they saw the footage that he shot, they were just, what can we say? I mean, it's beautiful. It's beautiful, you know, and, uh, and it's, Eckhart's kind of a master, you know. He's, he's a classic painter with light style of DP, yeah. and it was really fun to work with a guy like that. So Gamer's one of the very first uh, feature films that was shot on the Red One camera, uh, shot in, in 4K. Um, so uh, Mark and Brian, along with guys like Steven Soderbergh and Peter Jackson, uh, were among the first earliest of early adopters, so they were very bold. Uh, they were all about taking risks and understanding what those risks were. Uh, so th they're in a very um, sacred place uh, in, the, in the red world. They're, they're of a, a small, dedicated group of, of movie makers that are really visionaries, that really understood how to embrace technology and, and push it to its limits. And for one of the first movies to ever be shot on the red, uh, Gamer pushes the red and, and movie making in general to some pretty insane limits. You know, and every time they came up with something new, they would call us and say, guys, guess what Guess what we got now? Guess what we got now? And we'd always say, like, come on, no, you know, that doesn't really work. You don't really have that. Come on down. You got to come on down and see it, you know? And so it was really fun, you know? We feel like we kind of beta tested that camera. Red was with us from, as a, very much a partner from day one. They were on set. I mean, the very first build of slow motion we got, and it was one of those things where, like, on a Friday, we got a call saying, yeah, we, we, can give you seven, we can give you 60 frames a second or 72 frames a second. I can't remember which it was. And on Saturday morning, Jim Gennard flew out with a couple guys from Red and his camouflage private jet. 
with the build and they basically installed the camera and we took a look at it that you know by 11 o'clock that morning and they were very much you know as I said involved in, in making sure that we got what we wanted and we were you know trying to give back as much as we could because we we love the idea of the camera the, the image quality is astonishing um, and uh, so you know it was that kind of give and take they came in two times to figure out you know the issues we had we had issues with the uh, flares on the edge of frame, we had issues with banding images, uh, issues with the shutter and stuff like, like I mean, s typical digital stuff. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't, a, you know, a big, big, big issue. And we said, oh, we can't shoot. But this support it is brilliant. And if I compare this to other companies, I have to say they are really, really fast. I had problems, I had them on the phone, and it was solved two or three days later. Really being very connected with uh, Eckhart, the DP, and uh, the directors, and a lot of the production crew, and the, and the folks at Lakeshore. So, you know, it was, it was definitely a collaborative, collaborative thing. We all learned a lot from moving through this process together as one of the very first projects to be shot with the Red One and then finished in this way. And not just the, the internal the computer of the camera, they also, the, the external, the physical camera itself, the, the camera body. You know, on one of these scenes, I was running through an explosion with a camera, and the camera kept going off, and I thought, well, oh, it must be the heat of the explosion that's turned off this camera. Yeah, we were looking at the playback, and every time the thing would get to the explosion, the camera would shut Boom. off, and everybody would go like, ah! And this then, damn red camera! There's a lot of things we learned along the way, uh, of which, you know, because Mark and Brian like to operate themselves a lot and run around with these cameras in super aggressive ways on, on roller blades and you know pushing these cameras in all kinds of ways that a, a normal movie wouldn't do. Um, yeah, there were there were definitely incidents where they were hitting the off button by accident. So we're, we're looking at it and we kind of realize that oh, there's a button right at the side of the camera where your face is, where you're holding it. Yeah. And every time the explosion happened, bam, it was hitting in my face and turning off. It wasn't the heat at all. So they actually popped that button out and threw it on the back of the camera. And problem solved. But that's the kind of thing that like. When you're in a laboratory developing a camera, you never think like, well, wow, if somebody's running through an explosion with this thing and the explosion rocks them back and the camera hits them in the side of the head, it's gonna trigger that button. I mean, that doesn't occur to you. You know, you have to be out in the field shooting crazy uh, shit in order for problems like that to present themselves. We learned a lot of things. We actually built into our software the ability to disable the on-off button on the side so that, because uh, there's an off, there's a, a run-stop button on the back of the camera and a run-stop button on the side of the camera. and um, in, in months after the, the process of shooting, we were able to put into this software that runs the camera to say, disable that button so that they can't hit it by accident. Now, of course, the, the low-tech way is to just put a piece of tape over it, and that works too. But yeah, so we just threw things like that. We ended up changing the form factor of the camera as well as the circuitry, as well as the software. Where they could put the monitors and how they're going to deal with the eyepiece. Mm -hmm. I even think that the, the protocol of what are you going to do with this card when it comes out of the camera? We kind of created this uh, system of, you know, double backing up each, each card right on the Mac, right there, right on set, so we could watch it and back it up at the same time. So uh, fun. Yeah, our entire, our entire, um, Video village. Our entire video <laughs> village and uh, sort of like workflow for protecting our footage boiled down to 200 flashcards in a Pelican case and one guy sitting at a laptop for a $50 million movie. It was amazing. On film, you don't have backups. You, I mean, you're dreaming to have backups, but there are no backups. It's just the actual film. And what we did, we pulled all the flashcards. We did uh, copies of flashcards. We have, actually, we were ending up every day with two copies and the original file. So we were sending the original file to the post-production house and we were keeping the copies. So, you know, everybody was sort of participating in the process of trying to make this all work, you know, and, and learning along the way and then passing information, of course, off to Red to, to spread to the, um, the their, you know, the community sort of has built up around this camera. So in that regard, it's like, you know, very much being a pioneer with this piece of technology. But we own two of these cameras. I mean, literally every movie we have made since this picture has footage that was shot on the red uh, camera. You know, the, the camera's literally sitting in my office. When we need something, we pull them out. We go off and shoot, you know, whether it's a establishing shot of a building or a VFX element or somebody's hand typing on a, 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 you know, a computer keyboard or a principal actor giving a monologue. I mean, it doesn't matter. These cameras really work extremely well. And we use it not only when we shoot 
the rest of the feature with, with the red camera, but we shoot it, and we, and we have, uh, uh, we've shot in the last couple years, or last year we shot film, we've shot um, the A1, the Canon A1 for Crank 2, we shot Genesis on Underworld 3, um, and we shot film again on Fame, all of which we used the red camera to shoot footage in between the principal uh, photography material. So it's a very versatile, tremendous, you know, machine that, uh, you know, we sort of rely on these days. They should be selling the red cameras right. for 100000 a piece, and they're selling them for about 17000 bucks. Yeah, if they, if they charge 10 times as much for their cameras, then people would have taken them more seriously. Yeah. Really. They would have been like, oh, wow. Actually, they should have charged more than every other camera, and then it would have been fine. Everybody would have said like, well, yeah, I mean, you know, if you... Sure, we could shoot 4K and we could have all this easy use, but of course you got to pay for that. You know, it's not going to come cheap. There were hundreds of people shooting with these cameras um, within the first five or six months of its life uh, for commercials and music videos and, and feature and TV. Um, so all of that sort of got into this big soup of how do we make this thing better that we just released a few months ago into the market. And a lot of what we learned from Gamer definitely got into uh, into the camera. So there was definitely a benefit that we as Red and users all over the world of the Red gained from this big budget action movie being shot with this camera so, so early on in its life.